My conscience won't let me go shoot my brother or some poor hungry people in the mud for big powerful America and shoot them for what? They never call me. Today, the black man fights and dies in Vietnam. He questions whether the real war is in Vietnam or America, in Saigon or Harlem. He represents a new generation of black soldiers. His bag is black power, black pride, and black togetherness. I just don't like it, period. I never liked it the day I came in. If I, if I had a choice between any, any, any military establishment now, I'd go to the Peace Corps. Most black men come up fighting. Yeah. Those are fed up. My hair is kinky and my hair is natural. I want to wear it. I don't think I'd, I like it over here too much. I'm extremely happy and satisfied with the military career. I personally don't see where the Army uh, really comes down on you any harder than civilians. I was over now, I think now, 26 months. I, I, I see him fucking private for 26 months, and I'm fucking private over two and a half. In Southeast Asia, between 1966 and 1969, blacks accounted for more than 10% of military personnel. During the late months of 1965, the black death rate in Vietnam had soared to close to 21%, at which time an embarrassed Pentagon ordered a cutback in participation of black troops. In Saigon, the women are beautiful and the soldiers live the good life. soft and high on the hog. Statistically, the black man in the army is more likely than his white counterpart to be sent to Vietnam in the first place. Once there, more likely to wind up in the frontline combat units, and thus, within the combat unit, is more likely than the white to be killed or wounded. Today's black draftee will most likely find himself with a rifle, probably in some Vietnamese rice field. Carrying a rifle in the infantry is just like pushing a broom in civilian life. The black man doesn't escape it in the infantry for the same reasons he doesn't escape it on the outside. Inferior education and opportunities in a racist society. River patrol along the upper Saigon River. South Vietnamese propaganda calls upon Viet Cong or Viet Cong sympathizing villages to convert to the government position.
I don't like killing anybody, you know, in VC, I don't like killing them. But it's a job, you know. It's a matter of survival. Well, I this way, I feel, I feel it's just a job, you know. I'm in the, I'm in the Navy here. I've been here six years. I probably may stay in the career. So, as far as my viewpoint, it's just doing my job, you know, as a Navy career man. I miss home. I want to go home as soon as I possibly can, you know, but it's just, just, just a job, though. It's part of being in the Navy. I feel the same way that Hayes feels. It's just another job, you know. I hope when I go back to the world that I don't have to face the same problem of fighting like it's happening now in the world. I'll probably go to school or to college or something. This is uh, section 593 is the number one section in Vietnam as far as kills per boat. We have about, we have about I think I average about 45 kills per boat. That's in a campaign of about four and a half months up here. And uh, it's the number one section in Vietnam right now. Check sand pans, uh, and most of the, uh, well, my main job is to keep these guns up. So you got, we got your 50 caliber here, and you got your 60. You got the M16, I got two M16s. I got 260 machine guns, and I got uh, two M79s, and I got twin 50s forward. Our main, our main strategy is mostly night ambush. We're going to the, the bank of the river. We're trying to find a uh, uh, dark area of bush tree, high tree line or something, or we can get into the shadow of, of it, you know, or well, they can't see us. And up here at nighttime, it's pretty, pretty dark, you know. We have what you call a starlight, which, which helps to see at nighttime. And we can uh, sit there and watch them, you know, watch them cross or watch them on the bank, and then we'll kill them, you know. That's what I mean. I mean, our primary job is ambush. It's a, you know, it's, it's a nasty job, but it's, it's necessary, though. I know if I go out there and he catch me down, he's going to blow me away, so I got to get him before he gets me. It's just, it's just a matter of survival, that's all. So, you know, the best man wins, I guess. Or, or, you know, or just being lucky. I've been very lucky <laughs> so far, you know. Not in the Navy, as far as this is what all I know. I'm on this dog on boat here to do a job, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm in this river division. And when I get like a, normally, this tour of duty on the river is, is 10, 11 months. And then, you know, they, they, they take you off. Now, I've, I've seen up north in the Army, I've seen a bunch of black guys, I mean a whole bunch of them out there. Now, I don't know why they're out there. I mean, I, you know, I can go up there and see this. I say out of about 40 men, half of them be black. Now, I don't know why the Army does that. I don't think it's right, you know, I mean, you know, I don't think it's right at all. Okay, I, I'm in the military as a black man. Everybody knows that. They can look at me and see that. Okay. I carry myself as a black man, you know. I feel the same way if that's all we're going to get respect. You have to fight. It's just necessary to gain respect. Nothing left left to do, you know. I mean, you know, you know the, uh, we take, we take, we take the uh, guy out there, the common black man. He has been pushed, 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 and pushed all his life. And he reached the point now where he just he want to push back, you know. And uh, I'm not going to go out there, you know, and be no time or anything to nobody, you know. And I feel like you said, if you push me too far, I'm going to step in the slack back at you. Tell you the truth, you know, I'll, be thinking about, I'll be thinking about going home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll be thinking about Charlie, too, you know. And hoping he don't, you know, he don't hit me before I hit him or something. But uh, I guess when you go out there, you got to have something, something to keep you going, you know. you got to have a little something, because, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard on your nerves. You know, you can, you can get down the dog and you don't give a damn and you just frustrated, you know, and you can't, you just, you're on this boat, you know, and you can't go for so far. I think about old times, and going home, you know, and give me some soul food, and, you know, boogalooing, and putting on some clean clothes, you know, and doing, you know, doing my thing, you know. And I mean, that's my whole, that's my whole, that's my whole thing.
troops and armored personnel carriers of the 1st Brigade, 5th Mechanized Infantry, conduct search and clear operations of suspected enemy locations along the demilitarized zone. background is North Vietnam. Navy men at Na Bay, specially gathered on a single boat, expressed their feelings. They don't like it. They uh, just look at us and they think, uh, that, well, they we're just trying to do something that uh, pissed them off or something like this. We was listening to soul music, and the guy said, we don't like that shit. Turn it off. We don't dig your dancing at all. And so we said, wow, like me, myself, I stand show patrol over there, right? I have to listen to country and western. We go in the club, we have to listen to it. We never complained anything, so we had soul music one night, no, a couple of nights, two nights, and uh, they said they didn't dig it, cut it off, and so he tried to pull it out of the wall, my, my tape recorder, and stuff went down, he got hit, right, and so they put me on report for uh, disobeying the order, refusing to stop dancing, right, which I think is very petty, and they also put me on report for assault, they said I hit the teeth, this uh, senior stroke patrolman, right, they said I fired on him, I hit him, right. I said, no, I didn't. Like, all the, all the brothers went up to my case. I ain't had to call much yet. It's been a whole month. They've been holding the thing. Plus, they've been keeping me on restriction. I can't leave the base. I just, I can't even go to the club no more. I'm on restriction. All I can do is write letters, read, or something like that. It's been a whole month. Like, that's the guy about getting off. I feel like it's already being judged. They find me not guilty. I already did a month's restriction, right? So I'm still guilty. I already did one month's restriction onto the base. There may be something lower, but I'm still guilty, right? They didn't completely find me innocent, but I already did some time. I don't think I'll get away. I think it'll be uh, not guilty, because the evidence they got ain't too good. On December 19th, Bobby Jenkins was found guilty by a court-martial board of all white officers, fined two-thirds base pay for three months, busted from E5 to E4, and restricted to the base for 60 days. If they see two, four brothers together in Vietnam, the first thing they say is, what are they up to? They're getting ready to plot something. They're getting ready to do something. It's the first thing that comes to their mind. If we go outside right now and all of us be together, you watch the eyes beam down on us because we're together. And so many incidents happen right here in our bay because just we're together. And they'll look at us, and the first thing they'll run, the SPs, they might not come right down the spot, but they'll be ready to, be, to come if something happens. If you go over to the club and we be in the club, you notice how many SPs they'll have in there on uh, duty in the club because we're in there. About two weeks ago, we had a meeting with uh, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Civil Rights from uh, the Bureau in Washington, Navy Bureau, Navy Bureau in Washington. We went to Saigon, a couple of brothers from here. And we rapped to him about that same thing. That was one of the main things that come out. And uh, he said he was going to look into it. Okay, well, as far as what he's been doing, he's been looking into everything. I mean, I can see some changes on the base right now, Tim Sim. One or two. Well, these people around here, they talk to us uh calls me up one day, just, uh, they're going to get this little thing going, so they're going to uh, try to uh, 
help the brothers and uh, the white man get along. So they started this little thing up and ain't no progress in getting into it at all. It's been going for like about four days now, you know. So they're going to tell me, says, uh, well, look here, we want you to be on the team, you know. So they're going to form this team, a white man and a black man. Yet still, every time I go up there, you know, discuss a problem with the man, the white man ain't never there. They ain't got no white man. They just want a black man in there so they can find out everything the black man is doing and what he's going through, you know. So they're going to try to put their own ideas on the white man because all white men think alike. Devilish and shit, you know. I gotta give you a couple of incidents. We went on the beach in town one day. This little shoe shine girl, about seven, eight years old. She said, The black man is ugly. Now, where do a little girl, a little Vietnamese girl, learn something like that from, right? And so we just look at her and say, Yeah, who told you that? She said, That's all right. She said, The black man is ugly. You're a monkey. Got a tail. And we said, Wow, this is foul. Because she never knew what black was before, before the white man come on. He bring us way over here to teach people something like that. Plus, he won't pat us on the back and say, I'm your brother. No, he can't do that. Like up in Saigon, there's some places you can't go up in Saigon. It's just like in Georgia, like, there's some places in Saigon you can't go. Yeah, you go up in Saigon down on Tudor Street and you walk in there, and you ain't welcome at all. And they'll let you know it. But let a white man walk in there, and he's welcome. That's his thing, right? But just like the world in Georgia, Alabama, wherever you are, even in the north, you got your things where you can go and where you can't go. Even over here in Vietnam, believe it or not. And you, they bring you way over here, treat you like this. In a way, in your mind, you want to rebel, but you can't. Because every brother knows that a BCD, uh, dishonorable discharge, right? They give it to you in a minute. If you get it, you know it's going to be hard when you get back. Right. BCD, bad kind of discharge, dishonorable discharge. Hey, I don't want you in my school. I can't hire you. So he done messed over you already right there. So he know he got, he got these things that he can always hang over your head so that you can't really rebel. You can do it and say, get away with it for a while, something small. But she really tried to bring about a real change in the people over here, the, the white man. I won't say the Vietnamese white man. He, he'll, he'll mess over you, he will. He got his thing, his ways of doing it. I want to say something, you ask that question. To me, if I got back and they try to treat me like this, I think, in a way, they try to keep me down, I'll pick up a weapon, just like the pound. And I go down with them, even in the world. And he taught, taught most of us how to shoot it pretty good. Maybe you've seen that today, he was out. He taught most of us how to shoot this weapon pretty good. I think I'll pick up one if he really try to take me way back down where I don't want to go. We can't go no way but up. Delivering this stuff, if we have any hits, anybody has any damage to the aircraft in any way, then let's call the mission and get out of there. And we'll try to get rid of the ordinance in a jettison area and bring it on back home. And the guy that has a hit, go ahead and uh, call it out, or if you have any trouble, call it out. And we'll have the other aircraft join up and give you a look over uh, to see if there's, uh, see what the extent of the damage to the aircraft is. But we definitely want to get out there. The uh, closest uh, suitable landing field there today will be the home base. So uh, if we have any trouble, we'll set course immediately for the name and uh, try to get out over the water and get rid of uh, any ordnance that we weren't able to expand. If somebody has to punch out out there, then uh, let's get the SAR effort started right away. We'll come up on guard frequency and squawk emergency and uh, call for King, and they'll come in with the SAR effort. And one thing we don't want to do is go below the altitude where a guy m might have punched out. We don't want to uh, possibly run into him. Uh, the E&E areas we have there today, uh, the thing you want to remember is try to stick with the aircraft as long as possible, uh, and definitely until you get out of the bad guy territory. Uh, normally the aircraft will fly pretty well even with bad hits, so don't be too quick to jump out. While I was in school, of course, uh, we had ROTC, and uh, I think that was my real first exposure to the military, and uh, just kind of liked it, so I stayed with it. To just to have my own airplane, uh, be out in the blue, uh, have my ordinance aboard. Well, not a real feeling of power. I, I don't know. I guess we all, you know, like to get up and be alone for a while. Uh, 
And that's just a way they want us to get away from it all. Uh, that's one way I look at flying. Of course, it's a job also. We have a very important job to do. And uh, I like doing that job also. But just to, just to get out away from it all with, uh, with an aircraft, I think that's one of the only ways that we have right now. Now, I volunteered for the tour. Uh, I think I could still be back stateside now if I really wanted to. I think here again in the military, you kind of get away from the, the black versus white bit. And uh, I don't know, I, I feel like if our country is set out with a certain foreign policy, then uh, I'm an instrument of that foreign policy. I uh, volunteered to be a part of the service uh, when we were in peacetime. So uh, if we have a war to fight, then I feel like I'm a part of it, and I should be right here with the rest of them. I would like to say, well, about the military, we, we got to have it, uh, if for nothing else but for the defense of the United States. And I don't think that we could say, well, because I'm black and uh, I'm mistreated uh, quite a bit or some of the time that I'm just not going to be a part of uh, uh, the defense of the United States. The full time I've been in service, I think I've only lived uh, in the community once for about a one year period. The rest of the time I've been uh, living on the bases with the people that I work with. So uh, you're pretty much out with it, except for what you hear in the news and read. And, and of course, if you take a uh, special interest in it. The thing about the Air Force uh, that I've seen is that there's no reference, really, to black youth uh, as far as your movement is concerned. I haven't seen any that I know of. I get my performance ratings just like uh, everybody else does, and these are submitted to a board, and when the board gets ready to review uh, my records to see whether I'm promoted or advanced or not, then they have no reference as to whether I'm black or white, so I don't think it really matters there. The only thing that could possibly get you there is would be your rating official, the guy that writes a report on you, and I haven't uh, had any problems with any of that. I've been in the service 22 years, and uh, I feel that uh, if I were a Caucasian, that uh, I would be a Sergeant Major right now. I'd hold the rank of Sergeant Major. I definitely feel that I have been uh, held back because of the fact that I'm black. Uh, even though, uh, indicative of my work, uh, I received numerous commendations, etc., and so forth. But uh, when I first came in the Army, you know, the Army was all black back in 47. At that time, we had two armies, black and white Army. And, uh, I've been in a position where uh, the individuals have told me, the individuals in command have told me that uh, because of the fact that uh, somebody else is a little older than I am and he's retiring, although he couldn't do the job as well as I could do the job, that uh, they felt that they would have the benefit of the promotion. Okay, fine, this is God. And then I've been in a position where individuals have told me, I'm sorry, we don't have your rank and grade here for this particular job. But then the moment that I would, uh, was ready to leave that particular unit on a PCS, uh, I find out that 10 days prior to the time of my leaving, orders have been cut, but they haven't been issued to the individuals, and they have been already promoted. In coming up to, I've had, uh, I think I've got about the same number of years that Dave has in. And uh, it happened to me once the same way. Everybody has his advance, and... and same thing. I've got numerous uh, commendations uh, saying, what a, what a good job you've done. You, you're A number one, we want you here. But in the meantime, the, 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 the white GIs were just getting promoted uh, uh, with less qualification than I had. So consequently, I had to have that idea that I was being segregated against. It's been pretty rough for black men to move up. I don't think that uh, the Army being regimentated as it is, uh, you'll never be able to force the top brass, military-wise, to, uh, to look at this. They'll tell you, oh, yes, there's a problem. We understand there's a problem. But it's not the big brass that's, uh, that's holding you back. It's the little uh, subtle things that are done in the command that you're assigned to that uh, the big brass is not even aware of. Uh, these things, uh, you have somebody who, uh, they'll hold you back, say, by... Uh, They'll keep a few things out of your records or so forth, something like this. Sometimes they hide things in your record when you go before a promotion board, something like this. I'm not saying here in this command, but in, a, in quite a few commands. Uh, uh, they will find you not qualified by many reasons. 
they may send you TDY because, uh, you know, promotion board's coming up, something like this. Uh, little things like this, you know. I little could... things that you could never prove that's really prejudicial. Because right, right. everything will bend toward the benefit of the service. The fact of our, our young black men uh, standing up and, and demanding what they want at this particular time has helped military-wise, has helped tremendously because uh, quite a few of the... Uh, of your commanders are actually flustered. Uh, they really don't know what to do. Uh, back in the old army, uh, they would have just gotten rid of you, period. Troublemaker, so forth. Uh, not now, because this young black, he comes and he stands up and he says, well, look here. He says, baby, this is what I want. What to get into is sort of... Um... Brigadier General Frederick E. Davison, the first black combat general in the history of the United States Army. Now assigned to the Pentagon, he was formerly commanding general of the 199th Light Infantry Brigade, Vietnam. Whenever, you know, a black man makes it, be it in industry or business or sports or something, you know, a lot of people say, well, in order to get to that point, you know, he had to sort of give in to the system and he had to sort of play their game or, you know, be an Uncle Tom or something like that. I'm sure you've, you know, thought about that. How do you, how do you feel about that personally? What do you say to this people that, you know, feel that way? It occurs to me that uh, it's rather sad commentary if on our own capabilities as individuals. It's an indictment of our faith in ourselves as a race. If we have to believe that any time one of us makes it, so to speak, this is a result of knuckling under. I don't agree with it. With reference to that portion of your comment about having to work within a system or in accordance with the rules of the system, if we consider the Panthers, and I just use them as an example, if I am to succeed in the Panthers, I have to operate in accordance with the rules of Panthers. I mean, in other words, they have a system, too. This is right. And uh, you pay your money and you take a choice. A lot of uh, men said that, well, look, they said violence is paying off for us in the military. In other words, uh, riots or rebellions, you know, at bases and stuff like that has led to the military really being concerned with us more than they were. So how do you sort of contend with that kind of success? Or? I think that any effort that is being made by any means at all is one that is directed towards recognition as just a soldier with all the rights that go with such recognition and also, by implication, all the responsibilities that goes with such recognition. I think that, uh, by and large, that uh, the Army, certainly, and I can't comment to the other services, certainly the Army is moving rapidly, taking many, many actions to ensure this recognition of an individual as a soldier. If this is the case, and if we are in fact, that is, if the Army is in fact, acting in good faith on this, then riots don't trigger it. You must bear in mind that we cannot accept in the military mutinous action. It's not a democratic club. I left my home in Georgia, headed for Vietnam, yeah. I had nothing to live for. Now I don't even give a damn Now I'm sitting on the dock of the bay Watching the tide roll away Ooh yeah Sitting on the dock of the bay Wasting time Listen to me Look like nothing's gonna change The island of Okinawa, Pacific forward staging base for Vietnam-bound men, equipment, and aircraft. Base for 55,000 American servicemen, 6,000 of them black. Beginning in 1965, 10,000 Marines have passed through Camp Hansen every month on their way to and from Vietnam. Yes. 
that's the reason for the riot. Yeah. I mean, you know. All right, uh, let's say now it's an order out. Can't be no more than five brothers on the streets at one time. You know, can't sit nowhere. No, no more than five, you know. Or else the riot squad is going to come. And they want to know, you know, this happened before. We got names, we got places too. It's all official, we know. But the people in the States don't know, see. And the way we see it is that they get us over here, away from home, and they'll misuse us because we can't get back home. See, on this rock, we can't do nothing. Tell them about the Sheikah, when we first got here on the rock, uh, we was uh, we all broke out in our dashiki. Spent our money for them, paid for them, all this good stuff. And uh, when they saw so many brothers styling their dashiki, they decided, well, boom, we ought to put a stop to this. We put them where uh, they can't wear they can't wear their dashiki without a collar to it. And uh, so boom, as being black as we are, we don't want to style our Afro clothes with no uh, collar because it don't belong. You know, it's not supposed to be a collar to it. Yeah, and, uh, look here. The point to that is that uh, we know black culture, you know. We are the black people. So how is somebody going to tell us how we're supposed to sport our clothes, you know? This is what we, I mean, this is what we're talking about. They don't want us to get a power here. It's nothing but a greeting. That's all. We can't wear our bracelets in the movie. How come? How come? It's illegal, they say. It's against regulation. They come down hard. We have to... All right, if you don't take it off before you come in the theater, you don't get in the theater. You know, this is the way they do this thing. Right on. They said the afro was legal. Am I right or wrong? That's right. That's what they said it was legal. We can spoil the afro. All right, this man, there's a lot of brothers here. This man here has got an afro. This is an afro right here, or somewhat of an afro. It's not big, no. But they want us to wear skin here, what they call it, high and tight. High and tight. High and tight. It's not my culture. Am I right or wrong? They come over here, they get, all right, a Vietnamese girl. She called me a nigger. A nigger, a Vietnamese girl. I know it's not part of their language. Can't nobody tell me that's part of their language. But I'm going to go over here. The beast, you know that. See, we go over here, we fight. Okay, we fight to defend the water we drink, the land we grow our food on, and our way of culture. We also fight to protect Wal Wa Rockefeller, Rockefeller's foundation. We fight to protect... J.P. Kennedy's foundation, all these different kind of foundations that the black man can't partake of, you understand? And then we go back, we continuously harass. It's not necessary. This ain't what we heard. This is what we know. See, we've seen it from the bird's eye point of view. We are the people here now, yeah, see. Yeah, we yeah, see it now. Yeah, this ain't what we heard. Yeah, yeah, you know. Also, I, I see y'all have been out in the veil. Now, just like he said, these people, these Oriental people don't know how to, don't know how to, where the word nigga came from or nothing. They have to learn how to speak it. You go out there in that veil. The first time I come over here, I go out in the veil. I falls into one of these places, and I'm thrown out because I'm black, you know? Because I'm black. They don't like us. They say, we start trouble. Now, who done put this stuff in their mind? You know what I mean? The bees just came over here and brainwashed these people. We get out here and try to do our thing, and they want to downrate us. Right on. Because we're black, because the beaten came over here and told them that we ain't nothing but trouble. Yeah, right because on. we got a strong rapper and they scared we're going to take the women away. Right right on. On. Right right on. On. Well, wait a minute, let me tell you something about Down South. Let's say Down High in July this year right here, when the so-called beast, this is what we call them because they act savage and barbarous like animals. They pull M16s on us. We had a uh, USO show on the 4th of July, okay? The people, it was a soul show, people might say, because most of the songs were black, okay? Because of this, coming from the club where they had the uh, USO show at, we come in contact with all these beasts with M16 rifles and whatnot, pointing at us, threatening to kill us. All right, well, this was reported to the proper authorities. The officer of the day, he didn't do anything. What did he say? Go hit the rack. A man that was in the opposing group, he threw a jar of cheese at the major. Nothing was done about that. But then again, when some of the brothers went and got their guns, you know, was going to get their smoke poles and use them. This is self-defense. Everybody come down on them. If I ever hear you going lock and loading your weapon again, you going, I'm going to lock you up. You'll be in jail for now. This kind of thing. You know, some more brothers know some more incidents. We don't get a fair shake. All right, what I say now might even incriminate me because... What they are here 
what they'll recheck about what's been said on this uh, program or whatever it is. You know, okay, it's all going to come back. It's all going to come back. All right, the brothers, if they resist, let's say uh, I want everybody to have haircuts. This is what the CEO or somebody say. Saturday, we will have haircuts. Come haircut time, if the brothers go out and line up their pro real nice, it's looking good, it's neat, and it's presentable. This is all that's necessary. But it's not by Marine Corps regulations, which when the regulations were written, we weren't in mind anyway. See, this is where we feel about it. They may be moving to get things together, but why should I wait for them to move to get something together for something that I should already rate? See, this is the way we feel about it. And we've been stripped of our cultures and heritage. And they don't want us to pick it back up. See, they tell us for they all these years. Own, what, what we really belongs to us. Our, our cultures, our heritage, they don't want us to, to regain it. Look here. Our brother don't worry. Because if one brother ain't got, then ain't none of the brothers got. Right. If one of them is got, then all of them oh, is got. This is the way it's been and this is the way it's going to be. See. So if one of us ain't got freedom, ain't none of us got freedom. Cosa Four Corners, a one square mile section of the northern tip of Okinawa that is strictly a black thing. No white GI and country western music, just black soul. black man should really be, what you say, drafted into the service. I should think it, it really should be a voluntary basis for a black man. If he's feeling enough himself that he should want to go fight for this country, he should be allowed to. But as far as the draft, every black man, send him off to Vietnam, he can go out there and fight, get shot at, but yet and still he come back to the state and he can't buy a house in Cicero, Chicago somewhere, you know what I mean? So what, what's the point? You know, what's the point of going to fight? As far as uh, on Okinawa here, uh, I don't think they really try to cater to the black man. It's really, and it's hard to get something for yourself in the military because it's geared for dissent, you know. If you dissent, you lose, you know. Either fall in line or you die. Okay, so uh, you almost have to accept the way it is. And if you try to uh, bring about a change, you best know what you're doing because uh, they will... Uh, they will mess you around. You'll be facing a court martial before you can know it. You know. What happened was they were having uh, they were having country and western on every Saturday, and it wasn't having any uh, soul at all in the army clubs. So I think it was a, a mutual feeling among all black people in the United States Army and the medical center. And why the fuck should we have to put up with a country and western night without having any soul at all? So we decided to uh, attend, you know, country and western one night. And we did, and what this brought on was MP cars and chaos and uh, arresting and checking for your past and checking for your qualifications and so forth to be in the club. If uh, things of this nature go, it's our club too. And why the hell should anybody come around and see us? You know, just because we come to the club one night. And uh, through this, you know, we got to see General Lampert and uh, we told him of the problems of, in the medical center as far as, as racial prejudice and so forth went. And uh, he said that as far as the Soul Night was concerned and the wearing of Afros being interpretation through all NCOs and not just the top ranking officers and top ranking NCOs, that it should be spread out among all NCOs. And what has happened is uh, I'm leaving the island tomorrow, my regular Duros is December the 12th. I have a 20 day drop and I've uh, 
three or four sets of orders telling me when to leave and when not to leave. Uh, you know. And it's not me. It's everyone. It's not the problem. The problem not only exists in the medical center. The problem exists all over Okinawa. The problem is, you know, is if you want to be black, then you have to fight the problem. You have to fight that you can't make with so much promotion, especially if you're a two year, two or three year man coming into service and going out. You know, you're not trying to uh, come into service and make it a career. You're trying to do your job to your country and go back and do your thing. But uh, the problem that you meet is uh, the problem they want you to be some kind of little white Negro, you know, fall into their standards, take second class standards like cutting all your fucking hair off or, you know, being a half man. And certain things, certain things are natural to you. And certain things you accept without any doubt. If I have to cut my hat, and damn it, every damn body else is going to have to cut theirs soon. I mean, a guy can wear a cowboy get up into all the clubs. He can get his tall hat on, the fringes and the boots and everything, and walk in the club. There's not one word said. But you let a man put on a dashiki, and the whole club, and Joan Lapp and everybody else will hear about it. You know, because he's broken arm regulation. See, they're not trying to, to make exception for you in any way as possible. They just ignore you in a sense. Uh, we got to fight a military machine right now, see? I mean, we probably got CIDs in here now, you know, memorizing every word we're saying now, you know? And they report to the man the first thing, you know? First thing tomorrow morning, so uh, we might be looking for attorneys, you know? First thing tomorrow. Pentagon official L. Howard Bennett, acting deputy assistant secretary for civil rights, discusses the explosive and tense situation among blacks and whites in the armed forces. I think that when you begin to talk with so many of these young men about soul music, they're really talking about a lot of other things. Soul is just a convenient handle which they think we immediately recognize as being a legitimate complaint. But behind it are a whole malaise of uh, not, uh, not very good conditions existing between blacks and whites in the armed forces or just uh, problems related to the military which have no racial connotation whatsoever. In the report I did a gloss on Seoul because I thought it was necessary to remove this from a very simplistic uh, interpretation into what I thought represented a more complex set of concerns. Mm -hmm. And I mean I assume these concerns relate to uh, promotions and rare area assignments and awards and the whole gamut of the, the whole gamut of ills. Uh, I want to say this: that uh, there is a real effort now on the part of the various of all of the services to see to it that the people who are selecting the music and selecting the entertainment uh, incorporate soul music and black entertainers. This was one of the uh, real gripes in 1968 when we were over in '69. I felt that there had been a marked improvement in providing uh, black entertaining groups. Now, Mr. Bennett, there, there, from our observation, there appeared to be a communication gap within the military, both in going up the chain of command and down the chain of command. A lot of troopers felt that uh, grievances they had were never, never got to higher authority. It somehow were stopped at a lower uh, NCO kind of level. Uh, what's being done about this, and two, do you think it's uh, in, in, inherent in the military uh, bureaucratic uh, institution? Well, I haven't studied uh, many of the bureaucracies, but I certainly have done a lot of visitation, study, and analysis of the problems in the armed forces. And there is no doubt in my mind but that these youngsters, both black and white, are correct when they say that there is a deficiency in our communication system. There is, and it is serious. The communication system doesn't function in terms of the transmittal downwards of policy and programs which are initiated at the top. It just doesn't reach in full vitality and force. The man lost down. Neither does the system effectively communicate upwards the grievances and complaints of the men so that it gets up to the highest command position. We're working on that right now. One of the things which I discussed in the essay which I did on command leadership was the necessity to effectuate a more effective and sensitive system of communications. 
not only up and down the line of command, but even the communications among the men. And among the things I've recommended is that we have human relations councils and committees, which many of the services and many of the commanders have already put into operation, a forum which enabled the concerned, uh, the aggrieved, and the complaining to come to a group which was representative of the total composition, composition of a given unit and have that Human Relations Council or committee directly communicate this concern to the commander and thus avoid uh, this uh, breakdown in communication. Well, how about the fact, I mean, a lot of black troopers we talked with felt that they shouldn't be there or be in the army because of the, you know, they felt that they were second-class citizens uh, at home, especially a lot of troopers from the South. I mean, I felt that they should, black people should not be drafted, uh, you know, because of the conditions. Well, I, I disagree with that. And I disagree with it because I suppose I've had the opportunity over a number of years to see significant improvements in social conditions affecting blacks all over the country and including the South. Uh, we have not yet arrived at that degree of equal opportunity and equal treatment and total democracy in America that I want to see us reach. But I am in a position as a result of being active in this field for approximately 30 years to see that we are moving towards that in spite of the fact that there is now developing in the nation a kind of polarization which I think is unhealthy for it. No doubt in my mind that every American citizen, black or white, has a right to support his country in time of crisis. And I'd like to say to the black military personnel as well as black civilians that our participation in protecting and securing this nation puts us in a much stronger position to demand every ounce and iota of democracy to which we are entitled. Yeah, I see, but what you're saying is that, you know, black men should give up their lives for something that they should uh, already have, or they should have certainly by birth, or by just the, the very fact of being uh, human beings. Well, I don't think I'm saying that, but I'm saying that among the things which you do to secure your rights is you give up your life. So, I mean, do you feel that the black man in combat is ready to, you know, trade his life for uh, psychological manhood status and, you know, self self-esteem? Everybody who fights for his country exposes himself to the hazard of bodily injury or, or death. And uh, this is part of the citizenship responsibility.